Allison Hart, and I'm the CEO of the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us today for the Government Affairs Forum. Our topic today is the pros and cons of the Metro's parks and natural levies, um, uh, natural area levy ballot measure. So thank you for being here. And before we launch in uh, to our program today, we also have another program coming up that I wanted to have everybody jot down in your calendar um, because it's a special session that we have put together through the Government Affairs program on PERS reform. And we have had the, the good luck of being able to engage John Tapania, who is with the president of Eco Northwest, and he's an economist, and he's going to give a presentation about the kind of the economic impact of PERS and PERS reform. And so that will be on May 2nd um, in the evening, actually, from 5 to 6. So please put that on your calendar. We did send out an email uh, to our government affairs list on which you are probably a part of. But if you are interested and did not get that email, it is on our website. So I encourage you to attend it. It's a really good and informative presentation. I've sat through it. And um, John has done a lot of work looking at um, kind of the economic part of the PERS reform and what that means to our state. So today, I wanted to thank all of you for being here and also thank our sponsors. Our presenting sponsor is Riverview Community Bank, and thank you, Casey and Larry, who are here. And um, as a note, the, the coffee cups that are provided um, as a part of the luncheon, feel free to take those with you when you leave today. Uh, that's a gift of Riverview. We'd also like to thank the Gresham Barlow School District. They have been a longtime member and sponsor. Actually, they've been with us 65 years as a member. Um, this year, we just... Um, they got to their 65th year, so that's a substantial investment in the chamber, and their um, support has been greatly appreciated. We also want to thank PGE and then our media partner, Metro East Community Media. Um, we'd also um, actually we don't have any elected officials besides those speaking. So with that, I also want to thank our board leadership who is here, and that would be Kirk French, uh, Matt Miller, Casey Ryan, and did I get everybody? I think I got everybody. So thank you so much. And then, of course, Andre Wang, who is on our board and also the chair of the Government Affairs Committee, and he is going to lead us through today's presentation. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, so next month, voters will have the opportunity to vote on ballot measure 26152, the Metro Parks and Natural Areas Levy. So for so a bit of background, Metro owns or manages 14 natural areas and 11 parks in the Portland metro area. So the levy seeks to address both the maintenance and restoration of uh, these areas uh, for a levy over uh, t uh, five years. To discuss the sides, both sides of this um, ballot measure is Metro Councilor Shirley Craddock, Metro President Tom Hughes, and former State Representative Matt Wand. I'll have um, uh, President Hughes and Councilor Craddock uh, do their presentation, and then I'll introduce uh, Representative Wand. So it's a pleasure to welcome back to this podium uh, Metro Councilor Craddock and President Hughes. Of course, we know Shirley uh, as her time as a Gresham City Councilor, elected in 2004. Councilor Craddock served on the Gresham City Council from 2005 to 2010. A retired health researcher and dietitian, Councilor Craddock is an authority on the relationship of diet and cardiovascular disease. She holds her bachelor's from Oregon State and her master's in health administration from USC. She has served as both past president and of both the Oregon and Portland Dietetic Associations. In November 2010, she was elected to the Metro Council, representing District 1, which includes East County and portions of Clackamas County. With her is Metro President Tom Hughes, who was elected as president of the Metro Council in November of 2010, but is no stranger to public service. Born and raised in Hillsboro, President Hughes was first elected to the Hillsboro City Council in 1976 and served on the council for 24 years. Then on uh, 2001, he served as mayor of Hillsborough until 2009. Now, some of you know President Hughes is a uh, high school teacher by profession, having taught history and government at Aloha High School for over 30 years. He holds his bachelor's in history from U of O and his master's in history from University of Arizona. And so as a tribute to his contributions to, uh, uh, to Washington County, the city of Hillsborough renamed their city plaza Tom Hughes Plaza, and he's also received numerous uh, awards and accolades for his service. So we please welcome Metro Councilor Shirley Craddock and President Tom Hughes. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much for this invitation today and have the opportunity to talk with you about the decision that the Metro Council made in November to approach the voters in May about this, um, this levy. And so what I'm going to do is give a little bit of history to the, the role that Metro plays in the natural area business, and then Tom will uh, get into more of the specifics regarding the levy itself. So Metro uh, has has been in the natural areas business for many years. This is not something new. Uh, when Metro was created over 30 years ago, um, one of the responsibilities the agency was given was the planning and policy making authority to preserve and enhance the quality of life and environment for ourselves and our future generations. So this is a, 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 one of Metro's responsibilities from the get-go in our charter. At the same time, the pop as the population was growing rapidly, uh, over 33% growth in 20 years, and much of the land that had been forest and open space, uh, meadows and buttes had been built on. Many streams had been diverted to culverts. And so as the land that had been taken for granted for many years as protected open space was becoming increasingly desirable for development to accommodate the grow our growing community. The very landscape that defined our region was being changed rapidly and irrevocably. So Metro inventory, per the re request of the region, Metro inventoried and mapped the remaining natural areas and learned that over 91% of the inventory natural areas uh, at that time was unprotected and was eligible for development per local land use and zoning plans. So uh, regional discussions began about how to retain our livability and our green heritage, the very reason that many of us have chosen to live in this area. How do we maintain our cities and need for a sustained economy, but at the same time be a great place to live? So do you, oops. Okay, so as you can see here is um, the, the Metro got into the natural areas business in the early, in the, in, ni in the 19, or in, um, before 2000. And at that time, um, um, Metro, uh, the St. John's landfill was closed, and Metro became responsible for the Smith Bybee Lakes. And then not too soon after, uh, Multnomah County transferred uh, their parks to the Metro uh, that they were no longer going to be in the, in the parks business. And so the, um, so the metro officially at this, by this time was officially beginning to take care of some of the lands in the, in the, in the region. The, so the, the um, regional leaders were asking, we need to look and have a master plan on how we're going to protect these lands. So a, a master uh, green space plan was developed and, to, and we work together as a region to, assist, to determine which are the most important lands that we protect and save for the future. And uh, so it, this will give everybody um, access to nature and protecting those natural values and functions of the land that are so important. So in 1995 and again in 2006, Metro appro approached the um, region and asked for their support to uh, support a, a bond measures that would help us purchase land to put in the public domain. Uh, it's, in this, this process it was, is a win-win. It's a win for the land seller and a win for the public. Uh, all the, the lands are being, that have been sold to Metro are from willing sellers. Uh, uh, the process is used is where the landowner per, uh, gets an appraisal, the Metro government has, has an appraised, and they determine the appropriate value. These measures were overwhelmingly um, approved by the voters in the region. And so uh, um, the, uh, began the purchase of lands at that time. So these, this is the distribution of how the, where the lands have been purchased throughout the region. The funds are being distributed equitably and purchases are being made equitably. A map was developed at the time before the, before the, and brought before the voters to and had um, identified strategic lands that were really the most important to purchase to put into the public domain. These are lands that are along streams and rivers. These are lands that are in the uplands. These are lands that are iconic areas that we don't want to have developed in, into the future. So here's a, here's a picture of a Blue Lake Park. This is uh, one of the, the, uh, the lands that, of course, Multnomah County gave to Metro, or we took responsibility for in the, in, um, the 1990s. Uh, this is uh, Oxville Park, uh, the campground that you can go in just a few miles out of the metropolitan area, go and camp. 
This is the Butte, the East Butte. So many of us know this, Butte, this view from Hogan Butte. And that is Hogan Butte, the top of Hogan Butte, has been able to be purchased by the city of Gresham with the, their local share funds that they receive from that Metro bond measure. And then this is the Marine Drive Trail that, along uh, the, the dike that's in the, uh, that takes us in all the way. The trail is almost fully connected now between Troutdale and Kelly Point, uh, out on the clump where the Columbia and the Willamette meet. So during, uh, so at the same time, Metro also became responsible for Blue Lake, or for Glendiver Golf Course, for the Gleason Boat Ramp, for the Chinook Landing, and 14 Pioneer Cemeteries, and those are all considered in our repertoire of lands that we own. However, as this portfolio has grown, the um, and our general fund has begun to, to to also shrink, like other jurisdictions are, are also experiencing, has become uh, a challenge on how we're going to continue with. Uh, keeping up the management of these lands. For 25 years, the Metro has been managing these lands through our general fund. So it's, this is not something that we haven't been able to manage in the past. But as the portfolio is growing, we've had, as with the recession, more, land, more landowners have been willing to sell their land and put it into the public domain. So the portfolio has grown faster than uh, we had originally anticipated. So um, I'm going to uh, stop here, and I'm going to let President Hughes take it from here on the levy itself and get into some of the details. Um, but um, I, then we'll af I assume then af after that we'll get into the questions. Thank you, Shirley. And um, thank you for having us today. I appreciate you coming out. Uh, to hear us talk about this uh, important issue. I want to apologize as we go into this. I, I just landed uh, Sunday morning at 8.30. I landed after a week in Japan. It's when it's 4 o'clock, I think, um, <laughs> according to my brain, and, uh, and therefore I should be someplace horizontal and um, not up and walking around. But uh, this was important, and I wanted, to, I wanted to make sure that we came to talk to you about this. As Shirley said, over the years we've acquired lands based on a, a couple of bond levies uh, that passed in the region. I think it's important to understand that the, the second of those bond levies in particular, which was the largest of the two, uh, was the one in 06, and it passed by about 60 percent uh, overall and basically passed in, in every jurisdiction in the region. Uh, there is a kind of a myth that has been created that that this program is popular in Portland and nowhere else. And, and quite frankly, the vote uh, in 06 would indicate that that's not true. It was about uh, within percentage points of being equally popular all over. <clears throat> uh, and the polling that we've done in the campaign to indicate whether or not we, we can pass this, which is a good thing to know before you launch into an election, is uh, – Pretty much the same way. It's a, it's slightly higher in Washington County than it is in Multnomah County, and it's slightly lower in Clackamas County than it is in Multnomah County. But it is a, in the 58 to 60 percent range of public support uh, in, throughout throughout the region. So uh, I, I think that that's an important thing to understand. The people in the region understand that in 06 and 95. They asked Metro, as their regional government, to purchase land for them. And they now own this land, and they would like, according to the polls, they would like to see uh, us have the capabilities of taking care of it. Um, somebody um, in the various calls I've made based on this made a, a uh, I think was channeling Spock, and he said uh, to buy the land and not take care of it would be uh, illogical. Uh, and uh, I think that there's a lot of people who really believe that. And, th and that basically is uh, what, the, what the no build or the status quo uh, would do, essentially. It would mean we'd have to increase fees, reduce staffing, and reduce maintenance of park facilities and habitat and restoration efforts. And that's, uh, that's from the level of support that we've got now. So the level of support that we've got now, which is about $600,000 in our budget, would actually have to be reduced in part because uh, uh, our revenues are declining and uh, our demands on revenue are increasing at the same time. And so, as with almost every other small government or every other local government, we're faced with declining revenues and increased costs, and this would be to 
uh, to uh, allow us to do some things with the uh, with those open spaces that we haven't been able to do. And I'm going to see if I can manage to do this. The right. The right. The right. Oh, and I'm pointing the wrong way. Ah. So on May 21st, uh, this is what it will do, a five-year levy to improve and protect water quality, uh, remove invasive weeds, replace aging facilities, bl read that Blue Lake, or uh, uh, yeah, Blue Lake restrooms, uh, expand opportunities to learn about nature, and provide more access to parks and natural areas. Uh, the, the levy will be about 9.6 cents per thousand of assessed value. Uh, we have talked a little bit about an average home in the Portland metro area being about $200,000, uh, which means that this levy would cost them approximately $20 a year. Uh, would raise $10 million per year for each of five years, uh, and 20% of it would be used to protect existing services. The other 80% would be used to enhance the, the features of, the, pro of the, pro um, the, the area we've just acquired. Oh, good. I can't. Uh, so uh, this is basically the breakdown of how 40 to 50 percent of it would be in restoring natural areas uh, for fish and wildlife and, and water quality. And that means essentially uh, we would pay to go into those areas and, uh, and restore them to a, to a certain natural state. Part of this particular uh, piece, by the way, is an interesting, uh, an, an interesting cost a proposal on our part is that within that that framework or that side of the 40 to 50 percent of the levy, uh, we're proposing to buy some somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.6 uh, million shrubs and trees uh, that are native sort of native species to replace uh, some uh, the areas that we've already got, and that has, uh, has sort of piqued the interest of the nursery industry uh, because that's a substantial. Uh, purchase on the on the market. We don't intend to grow any of those ourselves. We'll consult with nurserymen in the area and and uh, encourage them to invest in uh, invest their resources in producing the native the natural stock that we need to do that. The other part of the other fifty percent, I like to see as uh, the, getting to the same means by different or the same ends with different means, uh, improving natural areas for people, uh, conservation education and. Uh, and organizing, that's basically organizing volunteers, encouraging young people uh, to take active interest in the outdoors and to, and to uh, participate in, in activities. Uh, and also uh, a, a portion of it would go in, in grants to uh, local governments and, and nonprofits uh, that have projects that they want to do to restore natural areas in communities. Um, there's a lot of talk, particularly in, in Multnomah County, about compression, and uh, I've discovered that um, you probably don't want to know everything you want to know about compression, and, and I'm not sure I can talk about it, except that there, but we brought Brian Kennedy from our staff along, so it, if I don't give you enough details, uh, then Brian would be more than happy to fill in the details. Uh, basically, it's the, it is the, the limitation that, uh, that Measure 5 imposed, which says that we are limited in collecting property tax to $10 for non-school governments and $5 for school governments. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, that you have to understand about this levy, uh, and, and, and you, there are very few things that you can say absolutely without qualification about compression because compression applies each to each property. And so unless you're looking at a specific property tax bill, you can't tell whether that property is in compression, not in compression, about to go in compression, or, or anything else about it. And it varies from property to property. But there's some very basic things we can say about compression. Nothing in this levy would cause any kind of compression to the school districts. So this has no impact on schools at all. Schools are covered under a different limitation, the $5 a thousand, whereas local governments, including Metro, are covered under the $10 a thousand. And so therefore, our limit doesn't affect their limit. The limit is based on real market value and not on assessed value. And some of you, if you looked at your property tax statements, are aware that uh, because of, of uh, Measure 50, we now separate real market value from assessed value and typically 
in the Portland metropolitan area, a real market value has been higher than, uh, than assessed value, and the limitation is on real market value. So in those areas where real market value is substantially higher, those people aren't in compression until it gets down closer to, uh, closer to assessed value. Now, there are properties in the, in the Portland metropolitan area where they have reached that level, and they are in compression. And so for those properties, no new levy would be applied if they're already in compression. Uh, so what do you do? Uh, and second, the, the, the second statement about it that can be said that's absolutely true is it doesn't affect general obligation bonds. So anywhere where somebody has a general obligation bond, for example, our 06 bond to buy the land wouldn't be affected by this levy to maintain and operate the land. The other thing about general obligation bonds is you can't use the general obligation bond money to do maintenance and operation. And so you can only use it for capital for capital purchases. And so a lot of people have said, well, why didn't you just build in to the bond levy the money to maintain the land? The reality is you, you legally can't do that. Um, so the, the second thing is legal, local options levies, which is this would, would be a local option levy, are compressed first. So before regular levies on, on the government side are compressed, you have to compress this levy. And in the four East Multnomah County cities uh, have no local option levies uh, applied in, in those cities at all. Now that you just moved the library levy over to a permanent levy, the library levy is also a permanent levy. And so all levies that are, that are levied in Gresham, uh, Troutdale, Wood Village, and Fairview are all uh, – are all regular levies and so again a third general principle that you can apply is this levy would not affect any of their regular levies uh, and and so uh, we think that we have really taken into account the the issue of compression uh, and uh, so we're, we're we're moving forward we convened this committee some of you may recognize some of the members of the committee uh, not all exactly uh, fans of Metro or fans of, uh, of open space in particular. Some were uh, and said, what do you think? And they said, uh, you, ought to run a tax, you ought to run a levy of between 10 and 12 cents a thousand. And that's a stopgap measure. You're going to have to do something bigger later on. And so we said, okay, well, we'll do 9.6 cents a thousand because we think that that works uh, for us in terms of, of what we can manage to get. Uh, so these folks have, have uh, urged us at one level or another, uh, several of them, a couple of them have written letters to the editor and other uh, urging us to go forward with this. Uh, and this is the, again, this is the distribution. You see uh, metro sites, uh, larger, where larger restoration projects will take place. Again, those are scattered pretty much around the region. Uh, one... Uh, one area that looks a little hollow is kind of the center of the region, which is basically the city of Portland, uh, is not going to get much in the way of restoration money for this. So there are no sites because there are no sites there. Uh, so the bulk of the money will be spent out and around the rest of the region. And this is the timeline. Sometime in the future we'll do all of that stuff, but my eyes are so – can't read that either. Uh so we're we're moving forward. Uh, I mean, this is uh, important and an, an important prospect for us. We need to move forward on these. The sooner that we get started on doing the restoration, the cheaper it will be to do the restoration. And one of the things that we've been able to do with the bond levy itself is that uh, because of the depression in property values, uh, we have been able to buy more more land. Uh, and we have found more willing sellers. But, uh, but we continue to pick up land, and I, I understand that that bluff over across the way is, uh, is part, of, part of Metro's uh, 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 ownership. It's part of the 16,000 acres that we own. And there are other properties like that around the region. We've tried to focus on areas that have special view uh, or uh, water quality or an habitat. Uh, value. We have uh, target areas that we go after that we told the voters we would go after uh, from the get-go, improving trails, connecting trails, and those kinds of things. And so, uh, you know, the, I just, just got back from Japan, and one of the interesting things 
about uh, our trip is this year is we uh, we took along a group of architects and, and uh, landscape architects and engineers uh, under the program called We Build Green Buildings uh, because one of our we think one of our exports that we're going to be very successful with to the rest of the world, particularly the Japanese and the Chinese, uh, is our experience in the Portland metropolitan area uh, with sustainability. Metro's open spaces serve as a kind of a, of a showcase for what the Portland area can do and does do with open spaces. And many of the folks we talked to in Japan have visited Portland, have seen those, that have recognized that commitment, and it is because of that commitment that they are interested in looking at our engineers and our architects and our landscape folks uh, to hire them to come over to Japan to build those buildings. And so uh, this is an important economic uh, value for us as well as an important uh, quality of life issue. And for those reasons, uh, we would urge that you vote yes in May. And uh, I'm ready to turn it over to Representative Juan. Thank you, President Hughes and Councilor Craddock. To present the counter perspective, it's good to have back uh, former State Representative Matt Wand with us. Matt is a native of East County, and preserving the community and culture of East County has always been the basis of his service. He has served on the Troutdale Budget Committee, the Centennial Celebration Committee, Library Siting Committee, and the Troutdale City Council, and then also represented House District 49 in the State Legislature. A graduate of Northwestern School of Law at Lewis and Clark College, uh, Matt is the managing partner of the Wand Maddox Preston Law Firm in Gresham. Uh, an active volunteer, he's also an active volunteer at the St. Therese School, where his, uh, two of his three children uh, attend school, and he lives uh, in Troutdale with his wife Anne and three children. Will you please welcome former State Representative Matt Wand. Uh, thank you for being here today. You know, I, I'm... I have to admit that I was, I, I'm quite proud of uh, President Hughes here. Um, you know, after voting to sue the city of Troutdale, to be this close to the city limits is quite a, quite a courageous move on your part, sir. I might have stayed in Japan a little bit longer. Um, it's an interesting thing to listen to the varying philosophies that come primarily from downtown Portland. On the one hand, we have huge swaths of natural areas all over the state, forest lands and and uh, watersheds and natural preserves, and there, there's no access. We can't have roads, we can't have trails, or if we do, they have to be very minimal trails. We have to pay fees to go there. You certainly can't hunt, and if you do, uh, better make sure you don't have any dogs with you if you're going to go after those cougar. Those are the values that we in the metro area impose on others all across the state with very little regard for how it affects their economics or their communities. But here in the Portland metro area, that's not good enough for our green spaces. See, our green spaces have to be accessible, even if that means raising taxes. It's just an interesting aside as I wonder what the values are that we're proposing. And I may be able to resolve this right here and now. If we can get every state legislator in Portland to vote to open up logging and water in eastern and southern Oregon, I'll stand up right here and support this every day of the week. But of course we know that's not going to happen. You know, when I look at tax increases, uh, there's really three different things that I try to look at in determining whether or not to support them. The first is the strength of the economy at the time that the new tax is being proposed. The second is the fiscal restraint that has been shown by the body asking for the tax increase. And the third is the credibility of the body asking for the tax increase. And I think you'll see that in all three counts, unfortunately, Metro uh, is not successful in making a proper case at this time. First, the economic strength of the state of Oregon. It starts with one word, unemployment, and it's atrocious. But it gets deeper than that. Just by the numbers, we have one of the highest unemployment rates of the state in the nation. We're 8.2% this month compared to 7.6% in the United States. Our U6 average, which combines unemployment with underemployed and frustrated workers who are no longer searching anymore, is a whopping 17.2% average rate per month in the year 2012. That comparable, the, the comparable rate of unemployment for youngsters, people under the age of 25, in 2012 is also 
17.2%. We might be popular with the hipsters in downtown, but when they get here, they're not getting any jobs. The workforce size in Oregon is abysmal. Workforce size measures the number, the percentage of residents that are available to work that are actually working. <clears throat> it's 62.6 percent in March of 2013, which is the lowest since 1976 when I was one year old and President Hughes was in his first elected office. Young people, according to the Economic Policy Institute as reported by the Oregonian, young people under the age of 25 are being hit particularly hard and this recovery is passing them by. For the entire country, people with only a high school, uh, high school diploma have an unemployment rate of 29.9% and people with college have 8.8% unemployment. Underemployment is even worse. If all you have is a high school diploma, you're going to be underemployed at the rate of 51.5% and 18.3% if you actually have a college degree. Now mind you, you can't afford to pay back the loans from your college degree, but if you have the training, congratulations, you've just bought down your unemployment number. The Oregon average for 2012 for underemployment is 34.6%. We have the second highest rate of underemployment in the nation below Mississippi, but good news, we're ahead of Washington and California, although they're nipping at our heels. Apparently on the West Coast, the policies that we've been pursuing for two or three decades are an utter failure for young people that would like to live here. Our median income has been widely reported as 10% lower than that of the state of Washington, and even worse, from the years 2000 to 2012, the real wages, inflation adjusted for people under the age of 25 has declined, people with a high school diploma by 12.7%, and people that are college educated by 8.5%. I was talking with uh, 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 Michael Patrick before we started, and I said I'd been looking at, at the economics numbers for the state of Oregon, and I advised him never to do that, because that's how depressing it is. I don't frankly know why anybody would move here intentionally knowing that they are going to be putting themselves in a state that doesn't value the private sector and doesn't have much of a future for our young people. Secondly, it's time to look at fiscal restraint. And in order to do that, we have to look at the metro budget by the numbers. Because we have to, <clears throat> we have to know if we're going to raise taxes and give more money to a government entity, we have to know what they're going to do with it. And we have to see if they've made any other effort other than a tax increase to accomplish their objective. Here again, Metro doesn't meet the mark. If you look at their all funds budget from 2011 to 2012 fiscal year, it was 384 million. The next budget went up to 535 million. And the proposed budget for this time, all funds, is $481 million. Their budget is ping ponging a little bit. And according to their internal news reporter, um, the reason why there's the reduction this year is because they lost some federal grants. So the general fund might be a little more direct number because after all the general fund is where they're doing these types of things. Here too, there's no decrease in funding. From 2009-2010, their general fund revenues were 100, or expenditures were $101,541,076. 2010-11 wasn't available in what I looked at. But the last two budgets, this is what gets interesting, the last two budgets were $109 million, give or take, with the most recent being uh, 109.9 and the one prior to that 109.5. What do all these numbers tell us? The general fund for Metro continues to increase. So then I scratched my head and thought, well, maybe, maybe uh, there's some other reason why their expenditures continue to go up, and there is. There's something in government budgeting called a beginning fund balance and an ending fund balance. And the private sector, what that means is if they have money socked away in the bank that they can allocate. The beginning fund balance for 2012-13 was $27.6 million. Assuming they don't spend any of their contingency money, at the end of 2013, they will have spent 41% of the savings that they have in their budget. If you look at the employee numbers, it doesn't paint a better picture. In 2009-2010, their general fund supported 452.59 full-time equivalents. And in 2012 to 2013, they reduced it by an entire 1% to 448.75 full-time employees, approximately 1% reduction in the force. What we are seeing here, ladies and gentlemen, is that as our small businesses 
have been devastated, going at bankrupt, layoffs, pay freezes, et cetera. At Metro, they've only had a 1% reduction in force. And they include budgetary line items for cost of living adjustments and step increases and those types of things. In this particular instance, what they're asking us to do is to impose a 0 0.096 levy rate for five years. Their permanent rate is 0 0.0966, slightly <coughs> under an exact doubling of the amount of property taxes that we spend on Metro. Now, I will tell you this about Metro. There's one thing that they do exceedingly well, and that is double down on the property taxes that we give them. They only get about 10 to $11 million a year from property taxes, and they have found a way to grow that with grants and, and other programs from the federal government, and I'm, I'm actually in awe of how they do that. It's phenomenal. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we should double our own rate for Metro in a time of economic crisis. So thirdly, then, we have to look at credibility. Because ultimately, even if we have a strong enough economy, even if we believe that there's enough fiscal restraint in the public body and that they've put their ducks in a row to make sure that the tax increase is the last result, particularly in a bad economy, at the end of the day, we still have to actually believe that the money that we're spending and sending to them that they wouldn't otherwise get will be properly used. That's based on past performance. So let's take a look at the score there. The capital improvement levies, the, including the most recent one in 2006, actually included specifically restoration. I, I looked directly at the voters' pamphlet statement, which must be truthful. Maintenance is never included in a capital improvement levy. That's true. But restoration is considered capacity enhancing, and it was specifically included. So they could have purchased the land that they in fact purchased and then spent money restoring it with native species, cleaning up the water and doing those other things that now they want a tax increase to do. But they didn't. Instead, what they did is they took as uh, the downturn, the economic downturn and the collapse in the real estate market as an opportunity to purchase cheap land and they overspent. They bought land that they didn't have money to restore. They bought creeks that they didn't, ha they didn't spend money to replant with native species. That's not the best kind of record that we'd like to see before we send them yet more money with another ballot measure. Credibility. Secondly, there was never offered in the prior capital bond measures any permanent solution for maintenance. Now, you had to know that if you were going to purchase 10 or 12 or even 16,000 acres of land, at some point, you would have to do something to pay attention to them. God forbid they turn into an Occupy Portland or another Dignity Village. We don't want that in our green spaces. But they missed out at that time of giving us the opportunity to make a decision. And now it's a crisis. When you don't plan ahead completely and tell the whole story from the very beginning, it's a ding on your credibility. Thirdly, I looked at their legislative agenda. I thought, well, maybe there's something in the legislative agenda for this session that would give us some insight into where it is that they're focusing their efforts with their lobbyist. Their number one priority, a convention center hotel. I don't disagree. We need that, not in the least. But it doesn't support their credibility very much. And then thirdly, let's look at the current spending priorities. Their communications office has 22 full-time employees at a rate of $2.3 million per year, a director at a salary of $132,000 a year, three manager twos for $92,000 a year on average, and seven assistant public affairs specialists. I don't know what that does, but they're paid $61,000 a year on average. That right there is 25% of the $10 million a year they want to increase taxes for. And let's talk about the government affairs office with two full-time employees um, at an average salary of a little over $100,000 a year. You know, I remember hearing a governor from Texas in about 2008, 2009, and he stood up and he said, you know what? The state of Texas isn't, isn't going to do this recession. And they've spent the next few years doing everything humanly possible at the government and private sector level to refuse to accept a recession. 
And when I look around at the state of Oregon and I look at our governing class, some of whom I served with in Salem and other I know as friends and acquaintances, all good people, including these fine individuals here who I respect greatly, what I see is a slightly different take on the same thought process. See, here in Oregon, we decided that governments wouldn't do the recession. And so we've had tax increase after tax increase, library levies, property tax increases, operating levies, utility fee increases. We've got a $7.50 per month utility fee increase in, in Gresham that they'll, they'll give back if they can get an operating levy. They'd like to repeal ballot managers 5 and 50 so they can raise taxes yet again. All the while, I'm sitting back wondering, where's the sacrifice from our local governments? When I look at the number of my construction company clients that are bankrupt, good people, dirt under their fingernails that had never missed a payment on anything until the collapse, two or three pieces of iron, a little small family business that are bankrupt now, and I had to watch as their homes got foreclosed, and I sit back and look at these tax increases and realize that this is a pervasive problem. And at some point, regardless of the fact that it's unicorns and rainbows and we all love green spaces, at some point we have to stand up and say it's time for a breather. No more tax increases. Let's let our economy recover. And when the private sector is strong, there's plenty of money for government. I'm asking you to vote no on this ballot measure. We'll open the floor to your questions, <clears throat> uh, but uh, first question will go to uh, President Hughes or Councillor Craddock, um, and and that's and that was the to the question of the um, addressing the differences between the GO bonds on in 1995 and 2006 versus this operating bond in um, in 2013, and Representative Juan ad addressed uh, the issue of um, that restoration could indeed have been addressed in those bonds. Um, uh, any any response to that? Yes, the, um, the bond measure does allow some restoration, and Metro has definitely been doing that. So there, but it, we are not able to, it's not for continuous restoration. If any of you um, use the Springwater Trail, you'll see the benefits of that. Uh, the Metro has purchased lands along the Johnson Creek, and um, between, particularly between um, 242nd and Rug Road. And as you walk or bicycle out there, you'll see that at one point there were some houses along that that area that were in the floodplain. And so when the land was purchased, those houses were deconstructed and, and removed, and then there's been, there are plantings there. If you follow, um, if you look at um, many of the metro properties, there's been effort, has been restoration has been made. So yes, there, there are, the, the geo bonds do allow for some restoration, but it's not, it's not ongoing, and it's only can, a certain percentage of the bond can be used for that. The floor is open for your questions. And please identify your name and affiliated business, please. Hi, uh, Brian Lessler, uh, PDG Construction Services. And um, two, yeah, okay. Um, not that I'm shy and retiring, you'll probably hear me without it. Uh, to the question of access and looking at um, the percentages of dollars that are projected to be spent, um, as I recall from your graph up there, only 5 to 15 percent or so uh, of the funds were to be allocated for uh, access to um, natural areas or for enhanced access to natural areas. <clears throat> Just having been involved in some of uh, these open space transactions personally um, and had conversations about that, it was my understanding that, and we're surrounded here by um, somewhere around three or 400 acres of Metro-owned uh, open space to the best of my knowledge. Uh, I think the vast majority of people in East Multnomah County probably don't know that the public actually owns those, and there's certainly no opportunity to access those from a trailhead um, or a trail of any sort. 
uh, I would be concerned that <clears throat> there's not enough money being spent to make those areas, those several hundred acres, which are some of the most spectacular lands in East Multnomah County, uh, available to the public. Um, so I'm hoping that at least there's a higher allocation uh, considered for uh, access to these open spaces so that the public can really enjoy them uh, and be aware of them. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question, and, and uh, you're correct. The, the properties, actually, there's a, a variety of types of properties involved, and some of them um, have been purchased as, as these have with the idea of their view and that access is, is obviously going to be an important part of how those properties evolve, access and signage, so people know they're there and know, uh, know where there are places they can go safely. Uh, so of the 15% of the overall bond, properties like this will get more attention than properties like along the Tualatin River, for example, where uh, there's not much of a view. We, we bought the property primarily to preserve habitat and, and water quality. And having a lot of people in those areas is not really a good idea. So uh, we'll, we'll be very selective, but, uh, but we have acquired some of these properties with the idea that the public will, will have full access. And I was going to add to what Shirley just said uh, earlier is that we've actually developed three regional parks with the, with the bond levy, which were involved full restoration and, and uh, implementing a plan. The, the law is, uh, in terms of restoration is, is very, is a little quirky, and so uh, it, it requires folks who understand that a lot better than I do to identify what, what restoration is eligible under the bond and what isn't. But, but the, the, other, the other material, the making the area accessible, is very definitely uh, something we plan. It. And I, if I remember the budget for this project, uh, there is a certain... A range, a range of amounts, depending on which projects come forward first. So, you you could see that percentage increase a bit. Hi, Scott Hanson, local dentist. Um, my, President Hughes, when you talk about compression, what the ten million dollars is projected to be raised by this bond, will that actually come to fruition if there is compression in some of the areas, or will I mean, is that going to decrease the amount that the bond will actually bring in? And it seems to me that, like in the library taxes and other taxes, it seems like there's more people in the Portland area who are under compression than out in East County. Therefore, they their taxes don't go up because they're already at the limit, and yet East County's taxes do go up, even though we all get to vote for it. So they, some people get to vote for bond measures that they actually know they won't have to pay for, but they still have the opportunity to vote yes on those. Is that is that correct thinking on my part? It's correct in uh, the, the factual content that, that this, this, uh, this levy will lose, will lose money. The $10 million is optimal if there was no compression. We will lose some primarily in Multnomah County because of compression. But there's compression. Uh, there, there is some compression everywhere. It just, it's a, it's um, minimal in other places other than Southwest Portland um, and um, Parts of inner inner Portland, the, but uh, you know, I, again, I think it's be careful what be careful what you wish for because the folks who are under compression are are also mostly underwater. So uh, you know, they, they I, don't, I doubt if they actually grab their tax statement and say, "What taxes can I vote for now?" Because I don't have to pay them. I think they probably have other things to worry about. Quite frankly. Uh, Joan Albertson, AAUW, and I love catalog choice. <laughs> there's days when I go out to the mailbox and there's no mail because I'm using catalog choice, so good move on that part. Uh, my question is, where would this tax show on my property tax statement? Uh, I'm already into compression on education. I'm being taxed at 100% of my property value. I can't pay anymore for education. And then also another question, when Shirley and I were talking, she was saying that Mento is paying for one day of outdoor school. And my question is, why? You want to do the outdoor school first? <laughs> <laughs> I'll add two cents and let Tom uh, finish it. Um, 
Outdoor school is actually being paid through the Metro's general f fund, and it comes from our, our, from our garbage rates. It's a conservation education. And so Metro is, of course, one of Metro's responsibilities that we're not even discussing today is the role that we play in solid waste management. Metro is, you know, once your garbage leaves your house and is, goes to a Metro transfer station, there is uh, there's a fee charge to dump, to tip that garbage at that point. That's where over 80 percent of Metro's general fund comes from, and so part of that is how do we reduce our solid waste in our region? And one of those is through conservation education, and we've been very successful of that. We've been able to reduce the amount of that's going to the landfill, and so there's a lot of effort put on to conservation and helping people learn more about how you do that. So the Metro Council many years ago uh, supported the notion to help support uh, outdoor school because that has a conservation education program at that. And where it comes on your on your tax statement, I believe it'll be a separate item on the government side. Um, so it will not be, it's not included under the school side, but it will be included under the government side. I have a question, and it came out of when you were discussing the nursery part of it, of, of restoration. And should this uh, levy come to fruition, what is Metro's commitment to buying local and working with local um, vendors, because that's also part of what stimulates the economy. And from the Gresham Mary Chamber standpoint, that's really extremely important for economic development for us. So should this levy come to fruition, how would you focus on buying local? Um, well, first of all, um, um, we've um, committed, at least I have committed verbally, and that means everybody else has too, uh, to uh, working with the Oregon Nurseries, Nurserymen's Association to make sure that uh, we get their best advice on how to how to design the purchasing process. Um, it's it is actually very it turns out very complicated. And I I forced to learn a lot of things in this job, and I just had to learn a little bit about the nursery industry last week or week before last. And uh, so they they need uh, to get the number of plants that we're talking about. They need a three to four year lead time in order to get them up to the point where they would be able to be used. Uh, and so we, we do need to work with, we need purchasing agreements with local nurseries. Um, and it makes a lot more sense to do that locally than any place else because we have, we have back and forth communication with those folks. So we're gonna be working with the ONA to make sure that we, we do local purchases uh, from, uh, from businesses that um, have, have been pre-approved uh, um, and so I, I, th I think it, I think we'll we'll work out a, a process that is that is very good. We don't have that in place yet because we don't have any money to spend yet. But uh, but that's our intention is to is to work with local nurserymen. It wouldn't make much sense to buy native plants from someplace else. Uh, so I think you know we're, we've got the best stock of, of Oregon native plants any place in the world here. Um, I wanted to have you expand a little bit on um, this notion of supporting regional park operations. So when we have heard about this levy, it's been talking about how we enhance and we restore, restore and then expand opportunities for people to access. And then when I'm reading this and then seeing 20 to 30 percent going to regional park operations, which to me ought to be more of a general fund as opposed to an option levy, I would be interested to know what, what this really is talking about when it says operations. Well, the maintenance and operation is just the upkeep on the, on the parks, which is what we're currently covering about $600,000 a year out of our, our local budget out of our, our general fund budget. Well, I, I guess my point is that that seems to me where operations ought to be is out of your general fund and they not um, should be part of an option levy for a particular period to achieve certain goals. And so that's the 
piece that I struggle with this is that notion that operations ought to be in this option levy. Well, and quite frankly, most of the local option levies that I'm familiar with around the area are specifically for that, and it's it's because you can't use general uh, general obligation bond funds to do maintenance. Uh, so we, the one I'm most familiar with, of course, is in Hillsboro, where I was mayor for eight years, and, and we had uh, a, a, a local option levy, a, ten, a temporary levy that supported uh, a certain number of police, a certain number of fire and, and park maintenance. Uh, Washington County sheriffs uh, have a, a, a local option to do law enforcement. Uh, so the local option taxes have been uh, the, the that that alternative was added to the measure 50 uh, as a mechanism for uh, for allowing particularly quick uh, fast growing communities to keep up with uh, with the kind of maintenance obligations that growth was going to require them so this would not be inconsistent with that uh, with that concept If I might uh, expand on that, I mean this is this is one of the fundamental difficulties that we have with uh, local government and tax increase and levy operating levy proposals, which is that they what is put on the ballot is what is likely to be popular and to pass, but what is funded and sacrosanct and not available on the ballot are the types of things that would lose. For example, particularly here in East County. If you put a $10 million a year operating levy on the ballot for metro planners, it would go down in flames. Nobody would want to raise taxes for the planners because it's unpopular. They tell us what we have to do with our land and cannot do at the local government level, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so when, you talk, when I talk about credibility, what I want to see out of metro is an acknowledgement that this is important enough anyway. Whether we get a tax increase to get the luxury Mercedes or we don't get a tax increase and we're ending up with the jalopy, I want to see an acknowledgement that this is important anyway and that there are other places to move money from. That would increase credibility and make me more like to, likely to support it. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Larry Schwartz. I'm with Riverview Community Bank, and uh, thanks for coming here today. But Matt, first I want to say um, while you were talking – Talking about uh, the unemployment numbers, I was very thankful that the uh, wait staff had taken away my knife. <laughs> uh, but thank you. I have um, a couple of questions. Um, one is, it sounded as though there's nothing in the ballot that uh, necessarily directs the um, purchases of plants to the Oregon nurseries. At least that's what I think I heard you say. And the uh, the second question that I have is, is there a number out there somewhere as, as far as Metro is concerned as to the maximum number of acres that they would like to control or oversee, I guess is a better way of saying it, uh, because it seems a little bit unsustainable to, to purchase and then come back to try and get maintenance taken care of and back and forth and back and forth. So I'm just wondering those two items. Thanks. Well, the, the, the first question, uh, there's not a, there's nothing in the bill, or there's nothing in the ballot measure, the battle, ballot title, for example, that would uh, specify that we buy from Oregon nurseries in part because there's nothing in the ballot title that specifies that we're going to buy trees in the first place. So we have, a, we have, uh, we've been planning uh, what the plan will be if this measure passes, and that's where the, the, the tree number comes up. Uh, and again, um, my guess is that as we work through that, again, with the Oregon Nursery Association, we'll work through a, a purchasing agreement within that, that overall plan that will address the issue of local species. But I, I simply can't imagine that we would the, – the two options, basically, are, are to grow it ourselves and buy it from local nurseries. And we've already said we're not going to grow it ourselves. So – that really only leaves the option of local nurseries. There's, there aren't very many f people a long ways away that make the, the grow the kind of plants that we do. There's, there is no nursery industry virtually in the United States that's as good as our nursery industry, so there wouldn't be any point in going anyplace else. To, this, to the second point, 
Remind me again what to say. Is, is I'm, I'm doing a. I'm doing a. a, a yeah, I, you know, we, we haven't looked at a number of acres. We've got target areas. Uh, and the target areas, I think, include probably more land than the bond would allow us to, to purchase. Uh, some of the, in, and some of the out, outside areas, you wind up with the same amount of money purchasing a lot of land. Uh, some of the other stuff that we're really focusing on is uh, completing trails and that sort of thing. As it's in internal, the, the price of land tends to be higher, and so you actually acquire fewer acres but more value. And so we really haven't done the metrics on how many acres is enough acres because it isn't, it isn't about acres. It's about the value of what we're trying to purchase. So that's a little bit of a moving target. I guess my, I'm Lila Leathers with Leathers Oil, and I guess my concern is that the more acres Metro owns, the less tax dollars are paid into our system. So as our tax dollars decline because of the properties that Metro owns, that puts more of a burden on each of us. The second thing I have a question about would be the elephant reserve that's going in out at Sandy. Mm -hmm. Has anyone um, decided how much that's, I know you own the land, you bought it from PGE, but has anyone decided and uh, how much money that's going to cost us every year, how much just the employees are going to cost us, added more, adding more people to PERS? I, to me, that seems like a pretty uh, industrious uh, uh, in, um, project when I think that there are a lot of private people that would like to have their own businesses, and yet if we have to pay so much to government, we can't afford our own businesses. And I think private enterprise is really what made the country. Mm -hmm. One of the things I would say is that much of the land uh, that's being purchased by Metro, in some respects, uh, would be land that couldn't be used uh, because of its habitat quality or its, uh, its, its um, uh, water quality features. Uh, anyway, you could, the, you could, there could build next to it enough to, ha to harm it but uh, but it would be difficult to develop it. And so in some respects, we're not really taking land out of use. We're simply protecting the land at a level that it can't be protected. And also, uh, what, we've, what we discovered, uh, I think we knew it before, but what Forest Park has become kind of the poster child for is that you can't just acquire natural land and then say, okay, let's just leave it natural because... Uh, the invasive species are already there. It, it, they grow faster. They, they destroy the native vegetation. People move in, camp out, do those kinds of things. Uh, and all of those things require some, some um, responsibility of the owners. And so the property needs to be owned and it needs to be cared for. But uh, the amount, the 16,000 acres that we've taken out so far, uh, really haven't had that much of an effect on increasing anybody's property taxes, just because it's it's a you know against the total value of the of the region, it's really not a significant purchase. Regarding the land purchase, uh, the former PGE uh, land, that is not money, this, these funds would not be used for that. And so the Oregon Zoo is, you know, Metro on the other side of Metro's responsibility is we're responsible for a variety of venues. Those venues are largely, um, to a good part, self-supporting. The Expo Center is fully supporting, but the Oregon Zoo, I think, is about 70%. And so as we move forward on what we're going to do with, and how, with the elephant, um, off-site elephant facility is they're putting a business plan together now. And we that might be an uh, effort that we're working together with other zoos on the West Coast on how, how that's going to be managed. So that is not land that's going to be considered in, in these restoration efforts. And regarding um, Sue's comment about the parks, Metro owns, uh, is now responsible for at least six regional parks. We have Blue Lake and Oxbow. We have Mount Talbert. We have uh, Graham Oaks. We have... Um, What's the one in Beaverton? Cooper Mountain, thank you. Uh, so Metro has a significant park system in addition to the, to the natural areas. So, those, so we are, um, when you were asking about the operating funds, is that that's often traditionally what um, levies do help is with, with the operations of facilities. 
Uh, hi, uh, Joe Day, Southwest Office Supply. Um, I have to say, uh, I won't say it out loud, but there's only one thing I ever think of when I hear the words five-year plan, and if anybody wonders what I'm talking about, ask me after we're done. Um, I just see a couple of things here. Uh, I, well, first of all, thank you for the detail that you've provided about uh, how, how this levy would be used. Um, there are five words, two in one paragraph and three in another, that jump out at me. One is everyday maintenance. The other is regional park operations. This is a five-year levy. I, unless Metro is selling these properties in five years, uh, donating them to someone else, uh, you know, everyday maintenance is every day for as long as you maintain it. There will be, a, aside from invasive species concerns, you know, in, in natural areas, uh, I suppose this is a, at some point going to involve a staircase, a handrail, uh, a public toilet. What, how are those maintained in five years and one day? Well, I mean, it's a good question, and it's the question that the committee that we put together actually asked us, too. They said, do you need a long-term plan? The two things that we know about the five-year levy is, first of all, it will allow us enough money to go in and do some of the, um, some of the heavy lifting now. Uh, so at the end of five years, the $600,000 that we have in our, in our budget now uh, – it's barely barely enough to do to to do basic day to day maintenance on the regional parks. Um, if we uh, go into the other areas and pull out the invasives and do some of the main, some of the basic restoration work, uh, it's conceivable that we could stretch that levy or we could stretch that budget to cover some additional stuff. Not very well and not at the level we'd like. It would be kind of below the jalopy level, but. Uh, so uh, there, there's, it, I think we'll have a full range of options at the end of five years. One would be to, to say, say, okay, we, got, we put $50 million into the restoration and, and upgrade effort, and that should tide us over. Uh, or uh, we may say we need to do another levy, or we may say here's a different plan that we've had uh, that with the committee's help we've put together over the next five years. So uh, I think that we've... You know, it is, it's uh, not possible to know exactly right now what that's going to look like in five years. But you're right, it is, it's of a, it's a ongoing concern to, to everybody that's looked at this, which is, what, do you, what are you going to do after that? So, uh, and, I can't, and I will tell you, quite frankly, that in other parts of the region where they've used operating levies, where they've used the special levy as an operating levy, they've had to just had to renew it, so... Uh, If I may add to that just a little bit, it's a great question, and, and I'm reminded of the telephone tax to fund the Spanish-American War that is still being levied against all of our telephones. And um, understand that when you, when you, right, but understand that when, when and if we pass an operating levy like this, it does two things. Number one, it guarantees a constituency because there will be people that will go and use these new amenities that will like them, and then there will be a, a built-in constituency. Right now in the voters' pamphlet, there's six statements, five of which are submitted by uh, Mr. President Hughes. So next time there will be two dozen because there will be people and groups that have gone there. But, but then secondly and more importantly, they get to use the second favorite tool of the, the, the big local government theory, which is they get to threaten the people using them with user fees which is probably about the only worse way to fund operations than a general operating temporary levy because what that does is it, is it presumes that the only people that benefit are those that are actually using it, which ultimately is even less fair than a five-year levy. So it's a twofer that's terrible, and that's why I'm opposed. Well, interestingly enough, at Oxbow and Blue Lake, we already have user fees. So, um, And uh, failing this levy... Uh, probably we'll have to increase those user fees, but at the other three parks, so far we've uh, been able to avoid that. So, uh, and I'm, I, you know, I'm not deadly sure that I agree with Matt altogether. I think that there are 
features within each park that you that lend themselves pretty well to user fees. So the the disc g golf, for example, out at uh, Blue Lake, uh, probably ought to have a user fee attached to it so that people who are using disc golf pay the fee for having put in the disc golf course and not uh, and not the rest of us. But uh, but I think that I'm, I'm not fond of overall user fees on public parks either or public libraries for that matter. But uh, but anyway, so I, you know, I think that that's that's not a, a likely scenario if you pass it necessarily any more likely than it is if you don't pass it, and it already has a constituency, so that would be. Thank you. In regards to what the, the plan is for the future, there are there already are discussions occurring and have been occurring in regard what we might do about a regional solution to this because we recognize that. This is not self-sustaining, so we are. We are. That's one of the metro's roles, and is to is to bring the region together to talk about what are, what might we all do as the 25 cities in the region and metro about our park systems because they're all struggling on how we're going to continue to support them. So that that's already a discussion that's on on the table. Well, thank you very much for a robust discussion to our panelists. Thank you. Matt Wand, thank you. Shirley Craddock, thank you. Tom Hughes, Dominic Gato Gazaimas. And thank you all for being here uh, this afternoon. Uh, just a couple of announcements first. Courtesy of Review Community Bank, you are free to take your complimentary mug with you. And please take uh, about 20 seconds to fill out the evaluation forms uh, in front of you just to give us uh, an idea of the topics and issues on your mind. I uh, want to remind you of the, uh, our meeting a week from this Thursday, Thursday, March, or Thursday May 2, 5 o'clock at the Gresham Library. Uh, John Tapania from Eco Northwest is going to talk to us about PERS, a very clear, concise, understandable presentation of, of PERS and, um, and its current uh, impact and future impact on this, our state. Now I want to give you a special announcement on um, our next government affairs forum on um, Thursday or Tuesday, Mar May 28th. Tuesday, May 28th, we're going to be discussing healthcare reform, healthcare reform 101, what it means to you and your business. We're going to have Tim Rash, who is the um, government affairs director of the Oregon Association of, of Health Underwriters, is going to talk to us about the practical applications of healthcare reform, both on the federal level and state level. And just a reminder, we're going to have a special Government Affairs uh, Committee meeting right here at this table, just really brief for all the members of the Government Affairs Committee. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon. We'll see you next month. <laughs>